lunch ambulance? Would it bless you to pray? I would love to pray. <laughs> Dear Heavenly Father, we're just grateful and thankful that we can come to you and come to your word every day and with everything, Father. There's nothing you won't listen to. And there's nothing that you don't care about. Like it says in the uh, Gospels, you've got the hairs of our head numbered. So, Father, I just lift to you this fantastic group of people. I just thank you for each and every one of them because they, they are all important. And I just thank you for the jobs they do. I thank you, Father, that this goes on even if I'm not running it. Um, tonight just happened to be a good night. I was awake when Mike put out the, the alert. Uh, so I'm just grateful and thankful to be here. And I'll be here as long as my battery holds out. And I thank you for that. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Good. Well, I've got a additional teaching under the title of Progressive Revelation today. So without further ado, I'll jump right into it. Um, I think it's very interesting that uh, we have a section on our home page at TLTF called what did Jesus know and when did he know it and to me that uh, was a unbelievable revelation when I first uh, started thinking about the idea that the Gospels as I've always been taught were written to uh, Israel. It's the Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision, as the word tells us, even the Christian writings. And uh, being a minister of the circumcision, and uh, with his earthly ministry being before the day of Pentecost, and with what is revealed to us in the book of Ephesians. Uh, that the sacred secret, the mystery, was not known before uh, the time that it was revealed to the holy apostles and prophets of the first century, Jesus Christ himself would not have known it. And to me, that was a fascinating concept. The thing that really blew me away is I, I read the Gospels in a total new light. I just, <laughs> I realized that when Jesus Christ was talking about the Comforter and other things it, and how it relates to the resurrection of the just, which was known in the Hebrew writings, and uh, how Jesus Christ was teaching that during his earthly ministry, uh, things just opened up in a way that uh, never, I'd never read it that way before, and it made such, it gave you such clarity on the word and on that idea that I wanted to continue along that frame. Of course, my coup de vil right now, under everything I do, is uh, acts of progressive revelation of the mystery. But one thing I point out is. Life is a progressive revelation. It's the way God designed life. Life, you uh, are born and you're a baby, wah, wah, and pretty soon you turn the wah, wahs into words as you imitate and as you see what's going on around you. And if you're blessed and you have wonderful Christian parents, you start learning about God and the concept and you grow, uh, whether you... Uh, have that at start or not, if you're diligently seeking him out, he won't turn his back on you. God will always reveal himself to people that want to know. And as life goes, God knows I am not the person I was 30 years ago. And I was in the Word 30 years ago. I thought, matter of fact, I thought I was a hot shot 30 years ago. But I have learned a lot about Jesus Christ uh, I have learned a lot about our Father God and this wonderful body that we have all been placed in. So even being in the Word and looking at the Word, that relationship developed according to what I learned from God's Word. 
and it continues to develop just like any other relationship we have. I didn't meet these wonderful people you see before you and <clears throat> have ultimate, I respect them for who they were. They were sons of God and daughters of God, and that was easy to do. And then as they began to speak their hearts, then that relationship grew. It grew in fondness and trust and love, and progressively uh, it grew in a type of camaraderie where, I mean, the, these, these guys before you would pretty much give you the shirt off their back. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, Alan would probably love to just give you the shirt off his back just to do it. But, but that type of love and dedication grows. It's not something that's instantaneous. Uh, it was interesting. We had a trip with Monica last week, and one of the questions that John Lynn asked me was, well, did you know Monica before you did this? And I said, well, I mean, we go to fellowship, you know, two, three, four times a week online. And I said, and you know, Monica's been in the Word since the 70s. And, like, when you run into a person like that, it's like you've known them all your life anyways because – it's that mutual understanding of the truth that binds us together. Uh, Ephesians 4 covers that real well, to keep on the unity of the faith and the bonds of peace and laying out some groundwork for it. But in the uh, God's Word is a dynamic, progressive revelation. It's a, it's a unfolding from Genesis all the way through to the time that we live in today. And it will continue to unfold because we definitely have a future that's written about that God has so graciously provided us information uh, that we can look forward to. But what was understood literally in the Hebrew writings becomes figurative as the truth is continued to be revealed. Uh, an example would be Moses smiting the rock and water coming out of it. Uh, in the Christian writings, we understand that the rock was representing Christ and that the water was representing everlasting life. And that is revealed in 1 Corinthians 4. Uh, in 1 Corinthians 10.1, it says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under a cloud and that they all passed through the sea. Talking about the exodus. They were all baptized into Moses in a cloud and in the sea. Verse 3, they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Uh, now, truly, Jesus Christ wasn't there in person when this was going on, but he was their hope. And he was shown from Genesis 3.15 as the seed of the woman, that understanding of how this redemption would unfold continued to be unveiled. <laughs> and it took God 4,000 years to do it. <clears throat> uh, uh, definitely a progressive revelation. And there's another wonderful section in our site that, it's called the Red Thread. It goes through each book of the Hebrew writings and identifies Christ. But my point here is that God designed life as a progressive revelation. And it's no different with what has been revealed to us in this day and time. There was definitely, most certainly, a change that took place after the day of Pentecost. Uh, and that change entailed what God promised would mean to this body of believers that we now all belong to in the body of Christ. This is something that was not seen in the Hebrew writings. It just wasn't available because God had not revealed it. But because of the accomplishments of Jesus Christ, he was able to do abundantly above all man could ask or think with this redemptive plan in providing many sons and daughters to come into the fold. Now concerning the word, and we've all been taught 2 Peter 1.20, uh, knowing this first, if it's something that we should know first and, 
and must be pretty important, that no prophecy of the Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. 21 says, For no prophecy was ever made by the act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. And this moved by, literally translated, is carried along. And I think Luke 1 carries that idea. A lot of people get the idea, and I think we do this as we exalt men above their honor stage. In other words, St. Peter could do no wrong, or St. Paul, the uh, popes of, of whatever they were the popes of. But we get this uh, reverence for them above men and think that they are more than what we are as believers in God, and they're not. No, don't get me wrong. They're wonderful believers. They, oh my Lord, they did awesome accomplishments walking with the Lord. But they were men. They worked this thing out the same way we work it out. They they walked. They, they communicated. They had, they manifested the power they had. They listened to the prophecies. And they surmised the revelation and worked together to bring it to the body. And it's the same thing we do today. Every generation does this to one extent or another. And I will say to the to the point that we do this is the point to where the word is strong and powerful in each individual generation which in within this administration too. But in Luke 1, <coughs> I think Luke gives a very good explanation of how he wrote the word. And Luke was a good writer. Uh, in Luke 1.1 1, 1 it says, In so much as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us. I mean, <laughs> I read this so many times in my life, and I read right over it. He's talking about them putting their stuff together. Uh, they probably had a class. The Gospels. <laughs> and they uh, probably had video, and uh, I don't know if John's Lynn's old enough, but maybe he was in it. I don't know. But the point is, they put this stuff together, together. They, they looked at what everybody was seeing. They listened to each other. They walked by the revelation that the Lord Jesus Christ was uh, giving to them, and they surmised the word that we now so graciously have to read. But in so much as many as undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, from the beginning, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. It seems fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in cons uh, concisive order. Beautiful, beautiful, concisive order. Luke looked at everything he was learning from the apostles and the prophets that actually walked with the Lord and the writings and the notes and the things that they put down. And he compiled that along with his own walk that he had had. And he wrote what we have in the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. What an awesome accomplishment for a man's life. Everybody today thinks that they need to write 16 novels. Gee, many Christmas, just start writing. I mean, <laughs> it doesn't have to be 16 novels. Write your friend a note. Uh, the letters aren't that long in the Christian writings when you really think about letters. Now, of course, it's not like my grandmother Sophie. Her letter went, hi, Mike. Everything good. We love you. We'll see you soon. Bye. <laughs> that was her writings. But... They're a little bit more detailed than that, but we should do that. We should write things down. We should uh, continue to work on projects as God moves us to do that, and most of all, live them in life. But in verse 4, uh, verse 3, we'll finish. It seemed to me fitting as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in concise, consecutive order. Most excellent Theopolis. That's the way he starts Acts. So that you may know the exact truth about the things 
you have been taught. And I think this coincides with Second Peter. Peter understood this principle too. That's why he said that the scriptures came to us, the word of God came to us. It all came to this in this manner. It wasn't Moses sitting up on top of a mountain getting possessed with a quill in his hand or whatever, a, a, a carving for a stone or whatever. This stuff was worked out. It was thought out. It was walked out. And the God in the Hebrew scriptures, by messengers, angels, at the hands of angels, the Lord Jesus Christ in the Christian scriptures, at the hands of angels and believers, got this stuff in print so that people could believe. And it was progressive. It, did, it, it didn't come down and give a computer download with 65 gigs of information. It was a progressive thing. God never goes against your freedom of will. Now, he might be uh, exhorting in a very aggressive way towards you when he knows that you can accomplish something. And I say that because uh, Paul got knocked off a donkey on the road to Damascus. That's pretty aggressive. But Paul still didn't have to do what he did. I mean, he had freedom of will. He chose to be what he became for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 17 and 18, uh, the point, Jesus Christ, when he came on the scene, after, he was the Word of God. Everything that had been written up to that point culminated in the life of Jesus Christ. Uh, John gave another teaching, and I think it's in one of our books too, that he... The Word was his prescription for life. The Lord's prescription for life was the Word of God. When he read the Word, he, I mean, he knew from the revelation of the Word what he was to do. Was it no different than what believers before him or since him have also? When Moses learned the Word of God, probably in a, a celestial way at that time before things were written but he would have had writings too Moses didn't write Genesis <laughs> he went alive he, he he used what he had whether it was in carvings and writings that was handed down to him or his understand uh, understanding of the celestial writings that are visible that Adam would have learned from God as far as the Word of God he knew the word and he also progressively introduced another administration in the law according to what God needed to do at that time. Well Jesus Christ was the culmination of all of that. He was the purpose, he is the purpose of the ages. <laughs> he came to fulfill the word of God, to fully fill it up. And in John 1 17 and 18 uh, we need to understand it's very important to realize that Jesus Christ revealed God in a completely new light that had not been known in the Hebrew writings. Uh, and in this quote, it, I mean, it says in verse 17, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. No man has seen God at any time, verse 18. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He, that's Jesus, hath declared him God. Jesus Christ revealed and showed God in a perfected manner that had never been exposed before. Because he had the Spirit not by measure. God, this was God's Son. <laughs> this was God's new creation within that womb of Mary. This was a new, fresh start. And that life would have to be sacrificed so that there could even become a more refreshing. However, that refreshing was for Israel. Jesus Christ is and was a minister of the circumcision. In John chapter 20, uh, verse 19, we're taught this is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And one thing, as I told you earlier, 
that has happened to me since I started looking at this. Uh, because, I mean, I was taught, just like most of the people listening to this were taught, that Jesus Christ knew about what was ahead in Christianity. However, the scriptures just don't play that out when you really look at them. And when you look at the change in the administration that took place after the resurrection of the Lord, it really opens up the idea of not only what's going on now, but what better what was going on then, and <laughs> the hope of what will happen in the future. When those things are distinguished, I mean, it's just fascinating at how the Word and the Scriptures can open up to you. But in uh, John chapter 20, verse 19, and of course this is after the resurrection of uh, Jesus you know Christ. Mary was the first one to see him. Uh, he's, uh, he's been up for uh, the better part of a day now. Probably got rose late Saturday, and uh, this is Sunday, the first day of the week. And he appears uh, on that day, it says in verse 19, now when it was evening on that day, <laughs> the first day of the week, and when the doors were shut where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said this, that's, uh, that's his new spiritual talk too. He's imitating the angels. That's what the angels always say when they freak somebody out by appearing. Peace be unto you. Be at peace. It's cool, dude. Maybe in our language. Chill. <laughs> and when he had said this, he showed to them his hands and his sides. So the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Then Jesus said unto them again, Peace be unto you. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them. I'm going to try to do this in the mic. He breathed on them. And we're going to see he's preparing them for something that he did not teach in the earlier writings before he died and before the resurrection. He didn't show, he's preparing them for something that was different. In verse 23, or rest of 22, it says, He breathed on them and said unto them, Receive Holy Spirit. Uh, uh, the article D is in some of the text. It's not in the uh, writings. Uh, it's talking about a gift here. Receive Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of anyone, their sins have been forgiven them. If you retain the sins of anyone, they have been retained. Now Luke 24 49 gives a little bit more insight to post-resurrection Jesus. This is a new life. His other life got drained out of him. It leaked out. The blood went into the ground. He was dead. This is a new life. He has a new energy force that is animating this body. And something that is totally brand new. He has been begotten of God. Before he was begotten of Mary. Okay, he was definitely created by God, but who begot him? Who who born him? <laughs> Mary born him. <laughs> now he's born of God. He's begotten of the Father. In verse 36 of Luke 24, it says, While they were still ta uh, talking about this, Jesus himself stood among him and said, Peace be unto you. They were startled and frightened, thinking they'd saw a ghost, saw a spirit, is the text, pneuma, pneuma. He said to them, why are you troubled, and why do doubts arise in your mind? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost doesn't have flesh and bones as you see I have. Fascinating new life force here. He appears <laughs> and asks him, why are you freaking out? <laughs> uh, verse 40, when he, then he said this. He showed him his hands and his feet, and while they still did not believe it because of the joy and amazement. He asked them, you got anything to eat? <laughs> that is the most amazing scripture, I think. So cool just to prove that he is a man. You got anything to eat? Uh, I, don't, I usually do that when I'm at your house anyways, just in case I, I was, first thing I want to ask is, hey, got anything to eat? <laughs> but 
It's so down to earth. They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and they, and he took it and ate it in, ate it in their presence. And he said to them, "This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled, which is written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms." That's what he told them while he was still with them. He 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 told them the Hebrew writings, Moses the prophet, and the psalms. Then he opened their eyes so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise. The suffering and the glorification. All the, all the Hebrew writings is dividing up into that when it's referring to Christ. The suffering and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are the witnesses of these things. Now, this verse 49, the NIV does not do it justice because it leaves a very important word out. And the word, the word is and. And this word and we're going to look at. The young's at the bottom here. I have it down there just so I can point this out. And the reason why I use the NIV here is because a lot of people are using that today. And, you can miss some words that are very important because he's adding to what he had taught them to this point. I'm going to send you what my father has promised. Now, this is not a covenant, folks. This is a promise. And as far as I can read in the scriptures, the promise was to Jesus Christ. A promise guarantees that the promiser will take reigns of the situation for the promisee. A covenant is an agreement between two. You do your part, I do my part, we're successful. Jesus Christ was the promise of God. Jesus Christ, everything was focused on Jesus Christ. Israel was not going to be redeemed because of their good qualities. They were going to be redeemed because of the promise seed, because God would not turn his back on this son that he was going to bring in. But now he's going to send this promise to them. And this, this should ring a lot of bells. Uh, Romans chapter 8, we are joint heirs with him. There's nobody in the Hebrew writings ever called joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you hear it, God never leaves us or forsakes us. There's, there's the condition of our redemption has been removed. Now, that does not mean the condition of our salvation while we're walking it is, <laughs> is guaranteed. You, got, you, got to, you still got to do right to get right. You can't do bad and make a mockery of God's truth. God, God saved us from the wrath to come. And there's, he is never going to turn his back on any of us. But as we, he expects us as children to progress in that revelation, in that relationship, so that we can walk as children of God. And we're instructed to do that throughout the Christian writings. Don't do, I mean the Christian writings. Don't do this bad stuff no more. Do this good stuff. You actually have power. And Jesus Christ says it here. But stay in the city <clears throat> until you have been clothed with power from on high. Now once again, uh, this and is a very important thing. It's key, a most common conjunction used in uh, the scriptures and it, 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 it determines a it's not a but it's not contrast it's an addition and would be a better translation also it's a new it's adding something to the thought so Jesus Christ is explaining to them here this is what I've been teaching you all this time about my sufferings and my glorification everything that's been written in Moses' assault and I'm going to send what my father promised. Well, who did he promise it to? Jesus Christ. Now, granted, there was going to be a life unfolding in the resurrection of the dead. The Hebrews knew that. They knew there was going to be a resurrection of the dead. But for these people to be associated with a promise from God before that, I mean, read Revelations. Revelations is very conditional. If you do this, you'll walk with me. You'll eat 
from the tree of life. You'll, all these things in the book of Revelation are conditional. They're conditional terms. Promises are unconditional terms. It's really fascinating when you get into this. It wasn't until after the resurrection that this message was added. And I should have put another D in there. Addition. Message had additions. <laughs> right? All right. Acts chapter 1 on one occasion. Again, same time period we're dealing with here. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the... The gift, the word gift isn't in here. It messes up the text. For my Father's promise. <laughs> what the Father promises in the text. What the Father has promised, which you have heard me speak about. We see it in Luke. We see it in John. Jesus Christ was continuously at, during that 40-day period, schooling them on this thing, this change. But he didn't reveal it fully. It took another 35 years for him to get it out to where people could understand it to any real degree. But they were still living it. They were still enjoying the benefits of it. My father's promise, which you have heard me speak about, for John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with, uh, and that's in, Holy Spirit, no article D. Now there was no, again, the resurrection was called the baptism from the dead. There, there was, they knew there was going to be a resurrection. But this is a new concept. This is not dead people getting up. This is well, kind of like dead people getting up. We're all a bunch of corpses running around. This is clay pots with power from on high unconditionally. Unbelievable. And they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom? Uh, and he said to them, he's so loving, I, I'm such an idiot because when I used to read this, I used to think, you guys are a bunch of idiots. But this was a reasonable question. It really was a reasonable question because this is what they had been taught up to that point. The restoration of the kingdom of Israel, the resurrection of the dead. But he said, it's not for you to know the time of the days the Father has put in his own authority. Jesus Christ doesn't know when he is going to come back. <laughs> God knows. But, 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 and this is contrast. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And this is the Panumahagion upon. There's a thing here, and I'm going to work this. I'm going to continue to work this. And go into, I'm going to go into the James and later teachings. There's a thing here about healing that is very, very, very important. Because and, it's, and, and you think about when a person, the, the idea of the power of God coming on a person, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and the other both part, ends of the earth. This, this upon, now up here in verse 5, it says, John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized in Holy Spirit. In, that, that shows a penetration, a thoroughness, a throughness, <laughs> being baptized through early. <laughs> Thoroughly, truly. Uh, but here is something coming upon you. And there's a there's a there's a consistent thing about the power of God being upon you and your willful reception of it within, both with communications and with original receiving here in the case of the birth. Um, I'll relate it to I can, if I have a communication with you as a person, and God is a person, uh and you come with something that you want me to believe or take in or act on, I have the right as a person to do it or not. I can take it into myself because we're both human beings and we both have the ability to do that, or I can reject it and stand against it and stay a part of it. I think that this is a telling statement with that idea concerning how we commune with each other, the Lord Jesus Christ, and our Father God, and the power that is available to us. There is a submission to his word as he communicates. He, there are times when God comes upon people. He, <laughs> he says, hey, need something from you. What do you think? <laughs> that's, that's the way he talks to me because I'm an idiot. But <laughs> And then you say, 
cool, well, what is it? And he communes. It's in the book of Acts. I mean, and that gets you moving in that direction. You're being carried along, moved along. And it also happens in individual things. When we go to him and we agree and ask for something, he usually confronts us with, okay, this is the real deal. Now, I'll tell you something else. The word doesn't say we get what we ask for. It says when we ask, we pray, we receive. That's the, it doesn't say we receive what we ask for. God isn't going to give us something that's going to hurt us. He doesn't work that way. Sometimes I'm a dummy and I ask for things that really I don't really want. Be careful what you ask for. You might get it. Well, God doesn't play that game. When you go to God in prayer and ask, then you will receive from God. He might tell you, no, you really don't want that. But you will receive from God. You will receive. It doesn't say you'll receive what you ask for. That's silly. God, if, if I did that to my kids, I did do that to my kids. That's why they're so bad. Anyways, good example. Uh, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and all the way to the ends of the earth. Now, this is a unbelievable prophecy that the Lord Jesus Christ is commanding here. And but it's it's like <clears throat> Genesis 3:15, the seed of the woman. It's a baby. It's it's a new thing. It's a thing that is going to ma be manifested in people to different degrees at different times over the next 35 years which is, for most people, an adult lifetime of learning. They're no different than what we were. They had to work this stuff out. They were coming out of one school of thought. Maybe you can relate to that. I mean, I don't know what religious background you came from, but <laughs> I'm sure as God has revealed his word to you through believers in the Lord Jesus Christ that you've had to kind of put aside maybe a few things that you knew before or thought you knew before that just weren't true. But this in Christ thing is a new concept, but it is all a free will thing. Uh, this word but is Allah, unlike the other uh, conjunction that we had. This is uh, definitely on the other hand. It's <laughs> talking about the other side. He's taking them to the other thing that uh, instead of. It's a contrasting statement here. Uh, for John truly baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized in Holy Spirit. They gathered around him and asked him the thing. And, and again, this, was, this is a good question. And the Lord just so lovingly sets them, gives them information about the question they had. Huh, it's not for you to know that time. Very short and sweet. And that's usually the way Revelation is also. Very short and sweet and to the point, And he directs them back on the path that he wants them to take. Now, by the time we get to Acts chapter 2, when this manifestation of what he said, probably 10 to 40 days, he's been, 10 days he's been gone. Before that 10 days, 40 days, because Pentecost literally is the 50th day after his resurrection. So, for 40 days, he was communing with them, getting them ready for this time in Acts 2.1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all gathered in one place, and suddenly, like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven to fill the whole house, and they were all sit where they were sitting, and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. A lot of stuff going on here, but basically they were filled, there's no Article D, with this new gift, this new life. And they began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit, the Article D, the Spirit was giving them the meaning. And I don't think any other manifestation that we operate operates any differently than this. I think that we receive it because of the revelation. We believe it. We have faith in the revelation when we ask. And when we go forth 
the Lord, we, we know it's the Lord that energizes that revelation. So uh, look for the article the when you're looking through this stuff. And it's good to have an interlinear in hand. There's no article the here with spirit holy. Uh, there is an article the, uh, and it's important to know it's the 12 that are here too. They weren't all in a room together above. That would have been crowded. I, that sounds like a college campus. All you need is pizza. Uh, uh, Holy Spirit is the gift. The uh, and and in conjunction with and they, who did the, who they were filled. They did the speaking with the tongues, but it was the Spirit. Peter exemplifies this when he heals the man. A couple chapters from here, he says, "Hey, you think it's by power we have that did this? It's in the name of Jesus Christ that this man has been raised." They immediately give give quality to the guy in charge so again a lot of stuff going on here but he prepped them for this and this was a new deal this was a and it would be progressively shown as the book of acts continues through uh, when we come uh, next time i get an opportunity to teach whether it's next week uh, the follow-up on it is we are going to do a line-by-line -line comparison of first and second Peter I think it exemplifies this idea of progressive revelation and I think I have a pretty decent thing worked out with it concerning uh, showing the difference in Peter's epistle and again I'm, I, I really believe that those two epistles are about 30 years apart what he wrote to the dispersion very early in the book of Acts, and what he wrote after, literally after the book of Acts, because he refers to Paul's writings as being well known. So your Ephesians, Philippians, uh, Colossians that Paul wrote uh, uh, at the end, or after, literally after Acts 28, uh, would have been well known in the Christian community by then, because Peter refers to them, and his tone changes quite a bit because of progressive revelation. So that's all I got for tonight, though.